Well, welcome this morning. We are, uh, we're back in the book of Hebrews, uh, and we've, I guess we've never left it, so, uh, so we're still in it, and, um, and we're pushing our way through. In fact, the, the book of Hebrews, we know, is, uh, is written to a, a reading audience that has a Jewish background, and so because it was written to a Jewish background, when uh, Jews read Hebrews, and it's all about Jesus, they went, whoa, my whole world is different now, because... Uh, because what the writer tries to do is span the Old Testament into the New Testament. I have to put my coffee down pretty soon here. Okay, span the Old Testament to the New Testament and say, based on what we see in the Old Testament, this gives us a better understanding of who Jesus is in the New Testament, in the first century. The Gentiles as well were blown away by what's here. But so, you know, our struggle as we've gone through Hebrews is to recreate in our own minds the Jewish mindset. And we're going to have to do that again today. And uh, unfortunately, it's going to get kind of messy. So, so get ready for a little bit of mess, but it's a necessary kind of mess. Uh, and to explain the mess, we're going to go all the way back. We're going to start right here in, uh, in Hebrews. Well, and, and let, me just, let me just show you again what our outline is. Remember, the beginning of Hebrews, we talked about um, the identity of who Jesus is. And for some reason, my clicker's not working. There we go. Yeah, the identity of who Jesus is through about the first four chapters or so. And then it segued into uh, what his role was, what his work is, what he came to accomplish based on that identity. And then the very end, we're getting close to this juncture, actually, after next week. Uh, we'll talk about our response now that we know what, the, what he's done and what he was all about, what we need to do because of that. Because it's not just all theory. It's like, now that you know who he is and what he came to do, so for you, here's the issue. And we'll get to that, actually, we'll get to that uh, week after next. So we're coming close to the end of defining Jesus' work in that sense. But remember, somewhere right here in the middle, we talked about the fact that he was a, a new kind of a priest. And for a Jewish mindset, that's, that's near blasphemy. I mean, you, you, have a, you have the standard priests who are descended from Aaron, and they do their thing in the temple, and God's very strict in the Old Testament about who can be a priest, who can't be a priest. But we understood that Jesus is a new kind of priest, not like Aaron, but like Melchizedek. Melchizedek, a, a different kind of priest. But if there's a different kind of priest, that means there's probably a different kind of deal going on. Not like the deal of Aaron's priest, something different. So that his next thinking was the fact that, yeah, now we have a new priest who's serving a new plan, a new covenant in that sense, a new kind of organization. So if you had a new priest who's doing new things on your behalf, that means there's also a new covenant, a new plan. So that's what we're right in the middle of right now. It's talking about this new plan, this new covenant with mankind. So we're in chapter... You don't even have a choice today. We're in chapter 9. We're going to finish chapter 9. Uh, it'll be a little bit of a recap from last week, but the writer does the recap for us. But in the midst of this recap, we need to also broaden our exposure. So I'm going to flip all the way back now to the Old Testament, to Leviticus. So we're going to start with this. Very strange passage in many respects. He says, so, okay, when any man from the sons of Israel, or, you know, from the aliens who sojourn among them, by the way, the aliens doesn't mean like aliens from space. We're just talking non-Israelis, okay? Anyone who's just even living in the land, if they're out hunting, catches a beast or a bird which may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth. And it's this section right here about pouring out its blood. So the, the idea in Israel was, was when you went and you slaughtered an animal to eat, just make sure that you pour out all its blood first. And when you pour that blood on the ground, you know, you cover it over with earth. But this is this pouring out of blood. So to this day, uh, kosher food, when you're talking about meat, the blood has to be drained out of the animal. That's why if you go to a Jew and say, hey, come over for lunch today. I've got this great thing. It's called blood sausage. They'll go, oh, no, we don't. We don't eat that. That's... Yeah, or bologna, yeah. We don't, we don't do that. Well, the blood issue is what we're going to look at today. That's the messy part of what I'm talking about. And all the way back in Leviticus, very early rules for the nation of Israel, God said, I'm very specific here. You need to drain the blood out of all the animals you eat. It's very important. You think, well, gosh, what is that about? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because? Because I didn't pour out their blood. 
didn't pour out the blood of the tuna. Ah. And of course, I was on a boat that I couldn't pour the blood out in this guy's boat either. <laughs> so there I was caught between two hard spots. Yeah, that's right. Well, we're, we're going to look at the reason why God explicitly said we want you to drain that blood. Because it's, it's, important, uh, it's important from a symbology kind of thing, too. Uh, it's kind of odd. So I was thinking in my experience, okay, Jim, I'm a very graphic-oriented kind of guy. And I'm talking about blood here. Oh, my gosh, what's going to happen now? You're thinking, I'm leaving. I'm, uh, here's my closest analog. Because, you know, we don't, we don't experience blood much, really, not in our culture. Uh, but back in their culture, you did. When you sacrificed animals, there was blood, you know, and, and people would get hurt. There was, there was blood. A lot of times we're, we're very blood, you know, we don't, the only time we see blood is when we watch, you know, really graphic movies. But we never see it for real. My only experience for seeing a lot of it was right here. You're going to laugh at me. <clears throat> it's right here. <laughs> turkeys. Okay, see, I told you you'd laugh. But, well, turkeys are just funny looking. That's why I laugh at them. When I was uh, growing up, we had uh, one of our relatives was in eastern Kentucky, Carter County, Kentucky, back in eastern Kentucky, up in the foothills of the Appalachians. And we went one time, a lot of family got together, and we went to my Uncle Woodrow's farm. We got to Uncle Woodrow's farm, and we said, you know what, we got a lot of people here. My mom was one of five siblings, and all the kids and grandchildren, just a ton of people there. What we need to do is feed everyone this afternoon, and we got this big old turkey in the back. I mean a big old turkey, a big job. And I was at the time maybe about nine or ten years old uh, looking kind of eye to eye with the turkey. I mean, that's how big this thing looked. I knew if it took a run at me, it could knock me over. That's how heavy this turkey was. So they said, well, we're gonna, we'll slaughter the turkey and we'll eat that for lunch today. And I'm thinking, whoa, cool. So, <clears throat> so as a city boy who's never seen this before, never slaughtered any animals, uh, I've, been, I've been scarred for life for what I saw. Uh, because what you got to do is you got to drain the blood out of this turkey. So you, you slit its neck, and then you hoist it by a rope by its feet so it's upside down. Look, it looks kind of like this right here, okay? You haul him up in the air, and you let him drain. And, uh, and the blood hits the ground and just soaks into the dirt, you know, and it's, uh, it's a nasty sight. <clears throat> What's nastier is... Uh, slitting the turkey's throat and watching it run around for a while uh, until it finally stumbles down on the ground and dies. And, of course, the job for the kids in this wonderful celebration was to chase down the turkey while it was bleeding to death. <laughs> Scarred for life. That's what I'm talking about. Scarred for life. So, so, uh, so here's, what, here's the deal. It's the closest I can get to. We would, we would take this turkey and we would bleed it. And, uh, and, it was, and, and you know, if you, if you eat turkey where you don't bleed it, you, you don't want to eat the turkey meat that's that's nasty in that sense looks bad so here's the closest thing so it, from a dining perspective it made sense to, to drain the turkey but if you go back to leviticus there's more going on than just a dining issue and what i didn't show you was the verses that just preceded that leviticus verse so let me go back and show you the verses that just precede that leviticus verse it's these right here leviticus 17 verses 11 and 12 just before the verse 13 one about draining the blood he says this verse 11 for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, no person among you may eat blood, nor may any alien who sojourns among you eat blood. So it's an issue of the fact that when you, when you understand blood, God's saying blood is life. Oh, and through the entire Old Testament, if you just take the word blood and replace it with life, you're getting the idea. Now, now in old times, you know, when, uh, when people were much more familiar with, uh, with the consequences of injuries, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Now we just call the medics and, you know, but there's injuries. They understood that, the, that blood, just like we know, blood courses through the whole part of the, of the creature, you know. If, if you uh, keep blood from making it to your hand, uh, there's no life in your hand eventually. If you keep it from going into your leg, you have no life in your leg eventually. So they look at blood and say, you know, blood's a, blood is really a great metaphor for life because it has to course through the entirety of the creature and where it doesn't go through the creature, there's no life anymore. So blood is life to the creature. And that's what God's saying right here. Now, you have to remember last week we looked at the fact that the temple and a lot of what went on in Israel was a parabola. It was a parable. It was a metaphor for a more real thing. And God designed us as creatures to be walking parables of a bigger thing. 
Now, you know, he's the creator. He can design us any way he wants to. And he created us with blood that courses through us. So we remember all the time through this that blood is life. And if you lose your blood, you lose your life. That's just as simple as it goes. So uh, the first thing they taught us in Boy Scouts in terms of medical training is if you come to be the first responder on the site, the first thing you got to check to see is if they're losing their blood. Because if they're losing their blood, they're gone. And then you go down a list of, you know, of, of vital signs and stuff. But I mean, if you're just coursing out blood, you might as well forget everything else. You got you to gotta stop the blood from leaving the body. So that's important. They understood that. And God's using this. And he'll use it today in Hebrews as a parabola of something extraordinarily important. The blood in us. Okay? I'm going to give you a few more verses here in a second because this is a mind blower. Now that you, we've established the fact that you're thinking like a Jew, you know you're not supposed to consume blood and you know that you're supposed to drain blood out of anything you're going to eat. We fast forward into the first century and here's Jesus teaching. This is an actual black and white photograph. No, come on. This is Jesus teaching. It's a kind of a picture of that teaching in the temple. And look what he teaches. Now think, put, put on your Jewish thinking cap. Think like a Jew. Think like the blood part. You know, you don't consume blood. And listen to what this crackpot, I say respectfully, says. John 6, 41. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, just prior to this, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. Okay, and then, but he goes on. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, well, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So... Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, drink His blood, you have no life in yourselves. Drink, drink His blood. Now you're, at, you're reacting like a Jew. Right when He says that, you should go, <gasps> Try it again. See, very, very good. Yeah, You should be shocked because Leviticus says you're never supposed to consume blood. And on top of that, he's saying to drink his blood. <gasps> and if that weren't enough, he goes on. Verse 40, 54. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Oh my gosh, he did it three more times. So in this entire passage, he says you need to drink my blood four times. And, and it's like the first time they go, <gasps> they're out of breath, you know, they can't spread. <clears throat> this is radical. This is, this is almost anti-Semitic. This is, this is almost anti-Jewish teaching. You don't talk about consuming blood, let alone someone's blood. And yet Jesus says it's the key to eternal life. And remember, you take the word blood, you replace the word life, and he's saying that the only way you're going to have real life is to have my blood in you somehow. My blood in you. It's almost as though he's saying, from a modern perspective, you need a transfusion. The blood you got in you right now won't get you very far. When it comes to judgment, you need the blood of Jesus in you somehow to bring life to this creature that's the very simple metaphor. That's the simple parabola he's trying to get. And at this point, I think he's just scared everybody away because they don't understand this. This is very early in his ministry. You must eat my flesh, drink my blood, drink my blood, drink my blood, and drink my blood. Okay, with that context set, let me finish the, the, whole, the whole passage. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father... So he who eats me and will also, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died, but he who eats this bread will live forever. So you have to have his blood within you and you have to be nourished by the bread of his body. Does this ring any bells for anything that we do in the Christian church today? Communion, yeah, that's exactly what he's aiming toward. And he's saying this very early, but he's making the connection in almost an offensive way about the fact that you need to consume his blood. God says don't consume the blood of any single animal all the way through Leviticus. And, then, and, it, and it's firm about this. And yet you get to this point, Jesus says you need to consume my blood. Now, one more, one more PS and then we're going to jump into Hebrews. Remember we said last week that the priests 
would sacrifice animals outside the temple and they would catch a portion of their blood and bring that blood inside and actually the high priest would sprinkle that blood on, in the access way to the Holy of Holies and actually on the Ark in the Holy of Holies in a way saying, I'm paving the way with this blood. So here's the only real use of blood in the Old Testament is somehow to, to deal with cleansing things and making a way into the Holy of Holies. But you never consume it in the Old Testament until Jesus does it. Really odd. So this is the, this is the whole culture of blood now that we, we live in the midst of before we dive in to the blood arguments in Hebrews 9. Ah, okay, here we go. We'll try and explain this. There's two key words in Hebrews 9. The one I've already mentioned is uh, blood, and it's mentioned 12 times. The other one that's mentioned is the word once, which is mentioned five times. So we're going to separate this end of chapter 9 with these two words. So we're going to look first at the word blood. So here we go. Uh-oh. We've, uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. <laughs> Let's move on. Verse 15 of chapter 9, he says this. For this very reason, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Whew, that is one long run-on sentence. But I'm counting on the fact you remember a little from last week. Remember he said that he is the new sacrifice that's been given on our behalf? And he even talked about how ineffectual the sacrifices in the Old Testament were. They, they did something in terms of cleansing but by and large, they brought reminders of repeated sin. Not really a final solution to sin, but sort of a washing, sort of a reminder. But he says, now all those people who were doing all that stuff in the Old Testament, now they themselves are going to be redeemed because of this new payment, because of this new covenant, a whole new way to take care of that. He says, a death has taken place for the redemption. Remember, redemption means payment. A death has taken place for the payment of the transgressions means sins for the payment of the sins that were committed under the first covenant. So he's saying those who lived in this first covenant, the Jews during the temple times and stuff like that, they never really got their sins fully taken care of. What went on in the temple was a parabola to talk about how they were really going to get taken care of through the spotless Lamb of God, Jesus himself, dying on their behalf. And because they looked forward, he's saying they could look forward in terms of when this Messiah would come and by faith they could actually understand God will make that payment for me. If you remember Abraham, God comes to Abraham says, to Abraham, uh, I'm going to make this huge nation of you. It's going to come out of your son Isaac. And then right on the heels of that, he says, and by the way, go up there and kill your son Isaac. And Abraham's thinking, uh, what? Well, actually, we know what he was thinking because we know that what he did was he obeyed to go sacrifice his son Isaac, it, which seems to be in stark contrast to the promise of God that a whole nation would come through his son because he believed that God would provide either a substitute or raise Isaac from the dead. God could do either one of those. So it wasn't like it was just a problem for God. He knew this. So he understood that there was a payment as well through another. Something else would die. And in fact, something else did die. So they, they caught this as they looked forward. Verse 16. Where a covenant is, there must of necessity be a death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it's never in force while the one who made it lives. What? Okay. Back off for a second here. Back off for a second. <laughs> the word covenant is a really interesting word in, in, uh, in how it's used right here. Uh, have you ever made out a will? That's what this word is. The word covenant can be used in one of three ways. It can either be made in terms of a contract, which we do to these days, uh, the first of three ways where basically two parties come to a mutual understanding. I'll do this. If you do that, well, maybe not I'll do this. If you do that, and you work your way toward you have an agreement based on two sides saying, okay, we're going to do this together. I will and I will. Great sign on the bottom line. That's a covenant. That's a contract. But that's not how this one's being used. Another way a contract or a covenant is done is where it's a will. Where basically it's, you know, the person who writes the will doesn't, doesn't come through some kind of negotiations with the benefactors, you know. If you wrote your will, did you bring all the people who are going to uh, inherit your stuff and say, okay, here's the deal. If all you people do da-da-da-da-da-da-da, then I will give you da-da-da-da-da. And then you know, no, I don't like that. I, I think we should go like this. No, you don't go through a whole negotiation process. A will is a one-way promise. It's a one-way promise. And, it, and basically, it says if you abide by the rules of this one-way promise, or you get zip. 
is what it says. But it's a freely made offer that really only uh, hinges on the receipt based on the way it's given. But the receivers can't change that promise. That's the way it is. That's wills. That's what this is like. And also this is, there's, a, there's a way in which these kinds of things were done in regular life as well, where it's a one-way offer. It's not a compromise contract where you come to an agreement. It's, I make this offer, take it or leave it. So that's what we're talking about here. So what he does is he slips into the last will and testament ro- mode right here, is what he's saying. He's using kind of the parallel version of how this is used in terms of the unilateral contract. And he says, you all know about the unilateral contracts of wills, Right? And a will is made, a promise is established. It says that I will give you da-da-da, you shall take this, you shall take this, you shall take this. Take it or leave it, no negotiations, right? He says, you know that 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 promise exists and it really doesn't come into force until the one who made the promise dies. So he says, you already know about this second way in which covenants are done. You're waiting for the death of one and then the promises are active. No negotiations, no haggling, the way it is. And when when the one dies, his word placed on paper is in effect. That's what he's saying right here. In the same way, in a parallel way, you can read this, for where a will is, there must be necessity the death of the one who made it. For a will is valid only when men are dead. It's never in force while the one who made it lives. He's using the parallel idea of this covenant, the one way death thing. So he's saying even in the alternate use of this covenant word that you use all the time in Greek, in the alternate use, you know that in will, someone's got to die. In this same way, this covenant, someone's got to die to make the will work, to make this covenant work. So you just bring that alongside. He goes on in verse 18, he says, therefore even the first covenant, we're talking the Jewish first covenant with the temple, was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and of the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. So he's reminding us of what we all remember as Jews, right? That even Moses, when Moses, who was, man, he was the big dude of the law. Even Moses, when he would speak and he would speak the law and it was read out of the book, Moses would take blood and sprinkle it on the book. Psst, and then all the hearers sprinkle it on you. It's a messy business. Oh, stop it, Moses. Okay. So as he's saying this, there's an association going on. Remember, blood is life. And so when Moses is reading the words of the covenant, he's reminding the nation of Israel what's going on, and they're being sprinkled with blood, they're actually being sprinkled with life. Now, blood is costly. Something has to die. So you don't have to be a PhD to figure this out. He's saying these words will bring you life at the cost of something that must die. But the promise is that you will have life because of it. See? Very, very simple. That's the parabola of it all. What's that, Bob? Yeah? Oh. Really? <clears throat> they flicked pig blood at you? Yeah. On the finger. Like, they okay. The yeah. There's life in the blood, and that life must be given from a creature that's going to lose its life so that you can be sprinkled. I mean, that's just really the very simple image is what he's trying to say. It's costly, but it brings life. Something must lose its life for this covenant to work so that you might have life, and that life is in the blood. He goes on saying, verse 20, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And remember, we did this cross-section last week about the, the temple. They would sacrifice animals outside on the left, and they would bring in a portion of the blood across the middle of the floor, up these stairs, and the high priest once a year would go in and sprinkle away into the Holy of Holies and up to the Ark of the Covenant, which is between those two cherubim. And, uh, and over the years, 
the front of the Ark of the Covenant, the physical representation of God's promises to mankind, would have the accumulated costly blood sprinkled over and over and over on it. Again, very simply, the way to the presence of God is through someone else shedding their blood, giving their life so that you might have life, and inaugurating a way into the presence of God. I mean, come on. It's just very straightforward. And when we're thinking from a New Testament perspective, you're going, oh, I, I, yeah, I know what he's talking about. This is what Jesus is talking about. You know, I, I understand that. So he's saying this is, this is what went on in the Old Testament. I'm just reminding you. Verse 21, and in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one might almost say, that all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is, there is a thought afoot that's wrong. That forgiveness is just to say, well, uh, you have incurred a debt because of your sinfulness. I'll just forget it. Well, when you have a God who's just, the debt has to be paid for. There's an offense. And so what he's saying is that forgiveness is not possible unless something sheds its blood unless something gives its life on behalf of you someone has to pay is the point point. and again we go back and say i get this jesus shed his blood on my behalf that so that i might have so that that blood in a, in symbolic it might be sprinkled on me so life might be sprinkled on me and i might find life through him losing his life being drained of that blood right, really simple forgiveness comes through the shedding of blood Let's move to this once thing because the writer says this is just an awesome deal. He's contrasting the fact now about the fact that in the Old Testament, in that temple we saw, the high priest was going in repeatedly year after year and outside animals were being sacrificed over and over and over. The word there is repeated. But with Jesus, who pays the price, we're talking not the word repeated, but the word once. Once. Verse 23, Therefore it was necessary... For the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. It was necessary for the copies of the things in heaven. What are the copies of the things in heaven? He's been telling us about. The temple. It's a, it's, it's a parabola. It's a parable. It's a copy. It's a huge realistic metaphor for the reality of God and where he lives. So remember, the priest comes from the outside and through the shed blood makes his way to the inside into the very presence of God. Who goes from uh, the contaminated world and makes his way into the very presence of God to plead on our behalf? Jesus. That's the real place. The temple is just meant to be a copy. But what he's saying is that even the copy, even the model, even the parabola of all that stuff, God decided to give us a clue about what it costs to come into his presence by cleansing the model with blood shed from animals so that we might understand that the way into the Holy One, into where God is, has to be paved with someone dying on our behalf. And if you go in there without that, you're toast. You can't enter in the presence of God, holy and righteous, unless somehow forgiveness of sin is done on your behalf and there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. So the way into that presence is through the shedding of blood. Woo. He's tying the Old Testament and the New Testament together. He's bringing them together. This is the reality. The Old Testament temple is a parabola. It's a model of the reality. See, that's the copy of the real thing. Verse 24. For the Messiah, Jesus, he did not enter a holy place made with hands, a.k.a. the temple, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as a high priest enters the holy place, year by year with blood that's not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. So Jesus' sacrifice in the real place, you know, for our benefit, he doesn't do every single year saying, well, you know, we're at New Year's, uh, New Year's Day. I guess we need to do something about all the sins of the people. So Jesus says, I'm going to climb up on the cross again. I'm going to die for mankind again for all, everything he did this last year. And year after year, Jesus dies on the cross for mankind. He says, no, that's what they did in the temple. You know, the high priest would come in once a year and he would, he would bring the, the blood, uh, the life blood of other animals year after year and do something. But Jesus' sacrifice, don't have to do that. One. 
once. That blood is so powerful that it can be shed once for the benefit of all your sins, past, present, and future, and for the sins of the people sitting next to you and for the sins of the entire world. That's how effective his blood is. So he's saying, don't get messed up about this. Yes, Jesus is our high priest, a new kind of high priest, but radically superior to the old high priest of the temple who went in every year. Jesus, with his own blood, comes in the presence of God for us, paving the way with his own blood once for us. Then he goes on. But now, once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. By the way, that put away sin means a completed act. He came to put away sin, the end. Finished, to put away sin. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment, so the Messiah also, Jesus, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, he'll appear a second time also for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Okay? So this is the consummation of the ages right now. This is kind of like the end of the age. He's been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The high priest who doesn't go outside the temple and sacrifice another animal on our behalf is the high priest who sacrifices himself. And through his blood gives us a new way through his blood in the presence of God himself that up to this point has been barred to us. Again, we'll, we'll keep saying this over and over. It'll come up again. Jesus dies on the cross. An earthquake happens. It's dark. And another incredible thing happens while he's there and he dies. The veil in the temple that separates the Holy of Holies, the presence of the abiding of God and, and all the unclean people outside is ripped from top to bottom like someone saying, okay, you can come in now. The very instant of his death. To a Jew an unmistakable message. The way into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, has now been paved through the death of the one who just died. Unmistakable imagery. And I want to I, look at verse 27. I quote this verse a lot with, uh, with people who aren't Christians, and uh, with Mormons, in fact. Inasmuch as it's appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment... So the Messiah also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation. And without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. The whole, the whole the nutshell picture of salvation for us is that we live here, and then we die once. Not over and over. Not, not, we're not talking reincarnation. This completely throws out the whole reincarnation idea. Where it's appointed a man to die once, and after that, from a salvation perspective, Judgment. Judgment. There, there is no picture of halfway places that you can change your mind and finally get your life straight between the death part and the judgment part. There's nothing there. So, so basically where you're at when you die is the decider of what happens when you get to judgment. There's no halfway house to saying, oh, I, and I've, been on, I've had phone conversations several times where we get into the nitty gritties of the debate and stuff like that. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm realizing this is just going nowhere. This is just turning into endless debate, the thing that Paul tells Timothy, don't do that kind of stuff. But at the end of that, the person on the other end of the phone will say, well, you know what, you know, this has been a great discussion, but you know what, ha, 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 this is where they get kind of light. Well, let's just wait until we all die, you know, and we'll get there, and, and you'll finally see it all. You'll get it figured out. And, you know, from my perspective, I'm thinking, well, wait. You don't want to wait until after you die to get it figured out because at that point, it's too late. It's appointed a man to die once and poof, after this comes judgment. There is no place to change your mind. And he was thinking on the phone, oh yeah, you know, it'll all become very clear. You'll get it. So let's just, let's just agree to disagree right now. And then when we get to that afterlife place where we got a second chance, you know, you'll get it straight and you'll get what I've already got. And I try and say, no. And if, if you're LDS, I go to Alma 34. Alma 34 in the Book of Mormon says what I'm saying. You better get it figured out now because once you die, it's stuck. That's in the Book of Mormon. And so when we read that, they go, oh, wow. I, I guess you don't want to wait. No, you don't want to wait. You don't want to wait. That's what he's saying here. Well, he's, he's using this again. He's saying, it's appointed a man to die once, and after this comes judgment. And in the same way, 
Jesus died once and will come back a second time by parallel for judgment. But this time in the judgment for you and I who have benefited from the life and the shed blood of Jesus without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. You and I eagerly await him because we understand that our sins have been paid for through the precious blood of Jesus. So we eagerly await to see him. Those who don't have that tremble in fear for, for judgment when it comes. When he comes a second time, judgment will be all about sin. But for us, it won't be because the sins have been wiped away through the precious blood of Jesus. We have sang about that this morning. So we eagerly await him. Uh, you know, the Apostle Peter says, you know, is, is the fact people complain, why is God being so slow? Why is Jesus being so slow coming back? He said he's going to come right back. Is he being so slow because he fell asleep or what's going on? He says, no, it's because he's desirous that none should perish. He desires that none should perish. The longer we wait for his second return, the longer we wait for judgment. Because when judgment comes, those who eagerly await him will embrace him without reference to sin. But those who don't are going to find themselves judged and to hell. I don't want to speed that up. I'd rather give the maximum opportunity for people to understand. Because when you die, it's sealed. There's no halfway places. Almost all worldwide religions that are false include an escape clause after you die. Because, you know, you think about, you, you think about well, what about my, you know, my wonderful grandmother? She was, she was just so loving and she loved us. And, you know, she never talked about Jesus, but she was just so good. And you're trying to tell me that she's going to go to hell? Surely there must be a place after she dies that she can finally get it straight and make the right decision. Well, biblically, I know. And I'm not being narrow-minded. I'm just being biblically-minded. No. We have to trust the fact that God gives all of us, in a very fair way, ample exposure to the truth before we die. I, uh, I, my God is not the kind of God who would deliberately keep you in the dark, and then you die in the dark, and he says, ha, 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 gotcha, you missed it, ha, 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 ha. He doesn't do that. Uh, in the beginning of uh, the book of Romans, Paul says, you know what, all, you can tell from all creation who God is. I mean, and it's, there's a lot that's built into us in terms of the way he makes our conscience. There is no one who dies without excuse is the bottom line. That's the bottom line. God is very good about getting his message across to people. So don't worry about that. But in all the false religions, they say, no, we have to have a place of second chances. If there's a place of second chances, then, uh, then things are better. Then I can believe that my wonderful, lovely grandmother is going to be in a good place because she's got a second chance. Or maybe reincarnation. Oh, that's a good one. Reincarnation. See, If it's reincarnation, if I didn't live my life now really well, well, then maybe I'll be reincarnated and have a second chance. And if my second chance, I do better than I'm doing right now, I'll get a little bit closer to what I'm at. And, and, and then if I die then, may I be reincarnated again and maybe get a little bit better. So, so eventually my hope is the fact that every time I'm reincarnated, I'll get a little bit better, one more rung up the ladder of righteousness until finally I get to the place where all my karma kind of accumulates with me and, I'm, Whoa, and something happens. <laughs> but it really, all it does, is it puts off for a long time your responsibility in terms of righteousness and sin. You know, you say, well, okay, I didn't deal with sin really good in this life. I'll give it another try next time around. It's appointed to man to die once. And after this comes judgment. Jesus died once for all, the just for the unjust. Poured out his blood on our behalf to clean us, to give us life in his blood. And when he comes back a second time, uh, that, that, that second appearance is for judgment. And that judgment for those of us who eagerly await him, won't be in reference to sin anymore. But for those who don't eagerly wait him, for those who don't embrace Jesus, who don't embrace the love of God, look out. And that's just the biblical word. Okay? Um, let me push on. At the end of Jesus' ministry, he has this wonderful supper with his apostles. And uh, looking at the account in Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood 
of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Now you're thinking like a Jew. Does that mean something incredibly profound now? In John 6, he's saying, drink my blood. And right here he's saying, drink it. Here, here we go. Blood poured out. When you see that phrase, blood poured out. A Jew thinking this, all they would think is the front entry of the temple and the animals, the bulls and the goats and the lambs that we brought who would have their uh, throats slit and their blood would be poured out and some of it caught for cleansing purposes. He's saying, my blood has been poured out. He's saying, I'm going to be sacrificed. And that's what that term means. I mean, they're just having these graphic images of all these sacrifices that they've seen all their lives as good Jewish kids and middle-aged. And, and they've seen this over and over. Blood poured out. For what purpose? For the purpose of bringing cleansing and dealing with the problem of my sin. And now he's saying, my blood will be poured out to accomplish the forgiveness of sins. And when you take this cup in your hands and you drink it, think of it like it being literally my blood in a sense. Blood is life. And because my life is poured out for you and you partake of it, you can have the life that I had. It's as simple as that. Yeah, Bob. This is ringing a lot of stuff in your brain today. That's good. <laughs> Uh -huh. But uh, before they would uh, let us go to uh, confession here, uh, they would uh, take us downstairs and make us sign a document okay. that says that we did take communion and that we are yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it, it, it really, like, like Darlene's saying, it's a remembrance thing. It's a way in which we remind ourselves uh, that, you know, if we get in the mode of thinking that if I live a good and clean life, I'm making myself more satisfactory to God right now, and what it does is it makes a mockery of the incredible cost of that blood that was shed for me. I mean, if Jesus died for my sins, then what do I think I'm doing trying to live a clean enough life to cover up my sins and that's doing anything? It's not doing anything. Again, all false religions will come back to the idea of, well, I, I can't just accept the price that someone pays on my behalf. I'd feel a lot better about this religion if you'd make me work for a little bit. Because at least that way I can kind of, you know, get into it and feel like I'm getting better, you know. The reincarnation thing is part of that. LDS is part of that. I mean, Buddhism is part of that. It's all part of that. I want to be able to work a little bit so I can feel good about myself and pay my own way. I want to pay my own way to Jesus. Well, then why did he die? Why did he shed his blood on our behalf? I mean, how do we ever think that our good works somehow have some kind of contributory weight against the blood of Jesus in terms of our sins? I mean, that is just so radically repugnant theologically, I can't tell you. And you know what's even more repugnant? To think that the price that he paid in shedding his blood for us might not have covered all of your sins. Almost every world religion that's false goes that way too. Well, yeah, God did do some stuff on your behalf, but you know what? There's some things you've done that I got to tell you, they're just so nasty. You're just going to have to work awfully hard to deal with that. I'm sorry, the blood of Christ just does not cover all your sins. So you better start working for the ones he doesn't cover. Well, where does that come from? I don't know where that comes from. That is also extraordinarily repugnant to the price of what that blood costs. Uh, an unnamed religion says that murder is one of those sins that cannot be paid for with the blood of Christ. And I've had some people on the end of the phone saying, you're telling me a murderer can go to heaven? Yeah, I, th I think so. Not an active murder. I'm not saying, you know, uh, 
a Charles Manson, I'm dedicated to murdering and I'm continuing to murder. No, I'm talking about a repentant murderer or something like that. Is the sin of a repentant murderer someone who comes to God on his face and says, I can't pay for the price of my own debt when it comes to murdering. I can't do this. I, I need to appeal to the blood of Christ to do that. Will the blood of Christ cleanse me from the unrighteousness of murder? And the answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. There is nothing that we can do that cannot be covered by the blood of Christ. Nothing. Is that just my opinion? That's what the Bible says. It's right there. The blood of Christ covers all those things. So there is no place, there is no loophole in the theology that he's presenting right here and that's in the Bible about the blood of Christ that says you better gear up and start working because there's a whole area of your life that the blood of Jesus just is not cranking for. It's just not biblical. It's just not biblical. The price was paid. His life is given, poured out, poured out on our behalf so that the life in his blood is imputed to us as life. And Jesus in this last scene of his life says, you need to take that cup and you need to say, I really need this. Nothing else is going to do it. I take the blood of Christ as my only way. This morning we started a, a new adult Sunday school and uh, uh, we saw a video and the speaker in the video said, you know, there's two things that we need to repent of when we come to God. Number one, we need to repent of all the bad things we do, the sin that we do. That's, that's good repentance. We understand that. But you know what? <clears throat> we also need to abandon and repent the thought that we can actually do anything good that changes our standing with God. We have to repent of the bad and repent of the audacity of the good. Because when you claim that the good you do has some kind of equal weight against the blood of Christ, you're saying that I can do something that's kind of on par with what Jesus did for me. And that's just horrible. Yeah, so when we come to Jesus, when we come to him broken, <clears throat> very aware of our sin, we also come to him with the second part of it, which is not only am I aware of my sin, but I'm aware that all the good that I could ever do in my entire life, like Isaiah says, is like filthy rags. All that good just is not as good as I think it is. I am so tragically messed up that the obvious bad and the unobvious bad, the good we think we do, both condemn us. I need the blood of Christ so that I can be eager to see him when he comes back again. Because I know judgment is all about sin. Judgment is all about justice. Justice and rebellion from God. And communion reminds us that it's all done. It's complete. The blood of Christ is done once for all. Once for all all the just for the unjust once for all all your sins anyone who embraces it but like this scene right here you got to take the cup you got to say that's my hope and my only hope is this blood of christ and communion reminds us of that because we slip away from remembering that we have life only because someone in a very costly way jesus himself died on our behalf poured out his blood for us and, and all the images of the Old Testament sacrifices in that parabola, that model of the temple that tells us about the fact that there's only, that the way to God is barred because of our unrighteousness. And through the shed blood offered on our behalf, something loses its life so that we can have life and we have our way into the presence of God himself. It all comes to a head right here. You've got to eat my body and you have to drink my blood because my blood <clears throat> is the blood in another, another one of the parallel accounts of the new covenant. Life with God made possible through this shed blood. Now we say all those words and from a Christian perspective it kind of sounds uh, so familiar it becomes hollow. But from a Jewish perspective, from a Jewish perspective, the cost of shedding that blood and, the, and of a man shedding his blood Brings us to our knees. You mean he died once for all? No more repeated offerings in the temple? Right. Right. And as we finish up this center section of Hebrews next week, when we go into the first half of chapter 10, he'll take, he'll take all of this. The new priest, the new covenant, this blood on our behalf, once for all, the just for the unjust, and he'll wrap it all together in a big bow and say, look what God did for you. First half of chapter 10. Look at this. Look at the cost. Look at what it accomplished. What's that? Being in the presence of God. Having eternal life, being in the presence of God. Jesus says, this is eternal life. 
knowing God. And he made it possible to come in the presence of the Holy of Holies to the beloved. He'll wrap that all up for us in chapter 10. Woohoo! And he'll say an incredible thing. If I can make this work. He'll say this. Uh, clicker's not working today. There we go. Um, he'll say, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. He has perfected for all time. Mankind, past, present, future, anyone who comes to him, he has perfected a lovely word I love to use again with a lot of my LDS friends who say, Jesus said in Matthew 5, be perfect as your father is, in per is, is perfect. And I say, yeah, it's all done. Right there. So we're going to look at chapter 10. He's going to wrap it up, put a bow on it. And as Jewish thinkers, you're going to go, oh, wow. Okay? So don't lose... Okay. In the Last Supper? Just 12 that time. But, but, when he offers his body to mankind, it has served billions. Work on that, BJ. Okay. Okay, well, let's pray. We need to wrap this up and uh, let's go to God. Lord, indeed, uh, a lot of this is so, is so much above us, but so much of it just hits right at the heart. It, it, things are gelling. Things are coming to a head. It, it, suddenly the picture of what goes on in the temple and, and the Jews and the sacrifices, the incense like prayers, the restricted access into your presence, paved by the way of the sprinkling of blood, something that gives its life on our behalf to gain, so that we can gain entrance to your presence. All these things, Lord, are, are swirling in our head and, and God, we ask that your spirit would, would congeal them, would, would bring focus on them, that we would come to understand in a fuller way because of the, the copies, the parabolas, the models of what the Old Testament, all that life was, that, that it might all kind of crash into our minds and our hearts. And Lord, that you might um, bring us to our knees and say, oh my gosh, this was an extraordinary price. And for me, who never could earn or deserve coming into your presence. But Lord, we want, we want to be humbled by that. And Lord, we want every thought about our ability to change our status, you, status with you based on our good works. To, we want that to be just wiped out of our thinking because it's the blood of Christ. It's not what we can do to earn your favor. If it was about works, then why did he die? So Lord, we, we want our hearts humbled. We want your truth to be merciless in terms of bringing us to a humility about where we really are. And as a result, Lord, to, to fully understand, to more and more understand about the glory and about the majesty of this one who came and died on our behalf. Lord, give us understanding as we continue to read Hebrews. And we thank you for it. We thank you for how for how you speak through it and how you um, break our hearts about the cost paid on our behalf and how you delight our hearts because of the hope that we now have and the eagerness that we now have at the end of all things to be with you face to face. That's eternal life, to know you. So God, we thank you for this and pray you'd continue to give us understanding through your spirit now and forever. And we thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.